someone very special to Alaska. Uh, he comes from a long family associated with Alaska. Uh, it was my very special privilege to know his father, uh, Nick Baggage. Uh, he was known to many of us as a great educator and advocate for education. And uh, then he went on to serve us in Congress. And I think he must have done a great job because he taught his son well. His son followed in his footsteps, advocating for, for Alaskans, wherever they may be. Uh, he knows Alaska. Uh, he was born here. He was raised here. He is committed here. He's not one of those politicians who comes to Alaska, makes their fortune, and then leaves. This is a man who is committed to Alaska. And in the short period that he's been in the Senate, we've been very proud and pleased to watch the progress that he's made. He's moved very, very quickly into a position of leadership. He sits on many uh, uh, committees that are significant to Alaska people, to Alaska Native people. And I know uh, through the Alaska Federation of Natives and others that we've had a great opportunity to work with the Senator and we know that he always has our best interest uh, at heart. And so now I would like to introduce to you uh, Senator Baggage, but before he speaks, I would like to call on uh, Bill Martin, Grand Camp A&B uh, President, if he would come forward first, please. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. Bill Martin, uh, Grand Camp uh, President. Thank you, Rosina. Um, if there are any other killer whales in the audience, can you come and join me, please? Most of you know that at the last A&B convention, um, we adopted Senator Begich into the, there's a killer whale sitting over there. Come on, Desiree. We adopted uh, Senator Begich into uh, the Tagwayne clan and gave him the name, and that name is Kawasting, which literally means Sai War Party. But we in the um, people of the Southeast, we, we speak in metaphors, and the real meaning behind that name, Kawasting, is the guardian of the seals against the oncoming killer whale. And it's kind of a protected name. So Senator Begich has lived up to that, made sure that the native people of the southeast are, are not disregarded in any way, and we do appreciate that. I'd also like to ask um, Edward Hotch and Albert Reinhardt to escort Selena and Ethel up here. And Senator Begich, if you can join us, appreciate it. We've well, been a little bit here and talk a long time. Huh?
So you, for those of you who are not Tlingit, uh, to be adopted into a clan, uh, it comes after you've demonstrated that you are a person who, are, who is worthy to be inducted into this clan. And as you've seen in the biographical information, that this is a man who has dedicated himself uh, to Alaska people and the Sakwedi uh, recognize this. And it, it is fitting, particularly at this time, as we have lost one notable Sakwedi, that we now have another notable Sakwedi uh, stepping into his uh, shoes. But to make this formal, we need to have a response uh, from the Raven side. So uh, on behalf of the Ravens, we'll ask uh, Paul Marks from the Sukhahadi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to make this official, Senator Begich. I've seen you in Anchorage and I've heard you speak in Anchorage. I lived there for 10 years. I don't, remember, I don't know if you remember seeing me at the gas station at one, <laughs> one time. <laughs> I wonder who took my gas cap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a souvenir. But uh, we welcome you to the Native community. And as a clan member of the Tlekwakhari and child of the Tukaneti, we honor the honor that uh, mm -hmm. the Chalkwadi have given you and given you a Tlingit name. And could you tell me the name again, please? Kawastin, and uh, this name is, uh, you know, many of our names are very honorable names and given a very high esteemed name, then the responsibility comes in being a servant to the people. And I thank you that you are standing up to the plate to help us and to work with us. Thank you. Cheesh. <laughs> So, welcome, Palestine. These are all his new brothers and sisters. Okay. Then we have to remember that when we go lobby, he's to bring his brothers and sisters. So now it is my pleasure to have Senator Baggage offer his comments, and then after that, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, they uh, were asking me, can, do you want to, they didn't have the button on there, so I couldn't button. They said, you can hold it. And I said, I'm a baggage. I need my hands. I got <laughs> I gotta move them around. I can't, it's hard. Uh, but thank you for, um, it's a great honor. I appreciate it. And you have no idea um, when I come back home how much pleasure it is uh, to be out of Washington, to be here back in Alaska and be part of uh, ceremonies like this, but also just being back with true Alaskans. So thank you for this great honor. I will do my best uh, every day to live up to it. If I don't, I know Rosita will remind me. Um, but I know I will uh, always always keep Alaska Native peoples as the first people of this country, of this state, always on my mind when we work on issues. So thank you for this honor. It reminds me why Alaska is such a great place. So thank you for that. Let me also thank uh, Klinkit Haida and Shimshan uh, for allowing us to be here on the traditional lands in Southeast for hosting this. And uh, to see Alaska, see, see Alaska Heritage Institute and Klinkit Haida for inviting me to be here uh, this afternoon. Thank you for eating before I got here because I have been at events where they're waiting for me to finish so they can eat. That is a really bad position to be in as a politician between anybody and food. So I'm glad uh, you ate. Um, and I know you have a busy schedule. I am 
throughout the day, we'll have a few more, a few more meetings. I got to fly out tonight, get back to Washington D.C. by the morning. I'll fly overnight because we have many things to work on, as you can imagine. I want to just give you a sense of a few things, and really just open up for questions um, that you might have on any subject. I'll try to do my best to to answer them. As mentioned, um, I'm on a few new committees, uh, which have great impact uh, to Alaska, but also on some ones that I've been on, but some more responsibility. I've been put on Indian Affairs, which obviously for Alaska is a critical committee. I'm now a member of the Appropriations Committee, which again is important for Alaska. I'll continue to remain chair of the Oceans Committee. This is a committee that deals with fisheries and NOAA and Coast Guard, atmosphere, all the things that when you think of Alaska are pretty important. I'm also going to chair another subcommittee over in Homeland Security and Government Services. This subcommittee deals with FEMA, it deals with emergency disaster, emergency relief, um, all the things that we see, I hate to say this, on a more regular basis than we should. And that it doesn't matter if it's the Chinook disaster up in, up in western Alaska or storms that occur in the interior or uh, forest fires or whatever it might be. Uh, this subcommittee will be under my jurisdiction and trying to understand what more we can do to improve the system. As many of you know, you know, we're in the budget situation back in Washington and we failed on Friday to get a conclusion uh, in regards to what we call the automatic budget cuts or sequester. That's a DC phrase, no one understands what that is, but it's automatic budget cuts that really are not uh, the best way to manage our budget. And I'm not afraid to make the cuts, manage the budget the right way, but when you do across the board cuts, everyone gets affected. Everyone gets affected, and the problem with that is some unfairly. And so we have to get back to work and see what we can do. And it's going to have impact to the BIA and Indian Health Services and Interior Department and our fisheries. It will have impact. So what we want to do is manage it in a more strategic approach of how to manage these budgets, not just a wholesale cutting. In the meantime, we're busy making sure we introduce some legislation that's critical. Uh, to Alaska. We've introduced another bill that we did last year. We brought it forward again. This we hopeful it will pass. It's $50 million authorization for rural housing, which will help provide housing for our um, teachers, professionals, public safety folks in rural Alaska. As we know when we want folks to work in rural Alaska, sometimes housing is a hard thing to get and quality housing. So the idea here is to create opportunities for local government tribes and others to have some resources that they can tap into to help build some housing to encourage folks to stay or come and work in the community. We'll also reintroduce a bill called the Day in Court Bill. The Day in Court Bill uh, we introduced, um, we did it this week, will be introduced this week, is really to ensure that tribal health organizations who have been shortchanged by the Indian Health Services for years get an opportunity to go back into court and get those resources that they were committed to. And for Alaska, it's millions of dollars that the Indian Health Service has short, shorted us for years gone by. So we are hopeful that we will be able to move that forward. Another bill, which again, I want to thank many folks here and throughout the state actually who have been supportive of this, and that's our Safe Families and Village Act. The idea of this is to take what we know is working. What we know is working in lots of communities is tribal court systems. We have a disproportionate amount of Alaskan Natives being in our, in our jail system, which is unacceptable. What that tells me is our system is not working to try to move to rehabilitation or moving them in the right direction instead of repeats on criminal activity. So the idea of our uh, Safe Families and Village Act, which we'll introduce later this spring after the Tribal Justice Commission report comes out, because I think that report will show that what we're trying to do is the right thing to do, and that is we want to work on issues of domestic violence and sexual assault and uh, substance abuse that tribal courts will have some jurisdiction on this, that they can help solve these problems in your own communities. We know this will work. I can tell you, uh, as a former mayor, the more you bring things to the local level, the better off it's going to be. We're going to be more in touch with what's needed, the right kind of justice that we need to have and how we manage our young people as well as adults who get into criminal activity. So we are hopeful that we will uh, bring that forward. Um, and we'll do that around springtime. Another one which I just talked about over at the legislative joint session, I'm not sure some of them liked my commentary because I know some of them are pushing this issue, but I oppose what they're doing on this issue and that is 
the issue of voting rights and what they're trying to do right now. There's two things that are occurring. The administration is trying to get Alaska exempt from Section 5 of the voting rights. What does that mean? This is something we've been covered by for 40 years. It ensures that when redistricting plans come out and other efforts around voting abilities, that the Justice Department reviews it. Why do they have to do that? Why do we need that? Because it's very simple. Because in years gone past, people would make sure it'd be harder for Alaska natives to vote, make it more difficult. And what this does is ensure that we have the Justice Department continue to have oversight. Because we know we've had the battle with the administration on making sure we have ballots that are not just in English, but in local language. We need to make sure that everyone, no matter where they live, what language they speak, where they come from, have the right to vote. And so we oppose. <laughs> and so we oppose what the Lieutenant Governor and Governor are doing in this aspect. The second piece is I know there are some in the legislature, and they, I could tell they, some of them gave me kind of dirty looks when I said this, because they didn't like that I opposed what they were doing, and that is they're also now doing a piece of legislation to require voter ID with a photo on it. Well, it sounds logical, why not? Well, you know better than anyone. I will tell you two people that work for me, um, their grandparents who live in a village have never had a photo ID, and will never have a photo ID. But for some reason down the hall street here, some people in the legislature think there's some fraud that's going on all over the state. There's rampant fraud. There has not been one case of fraud. They're chasing something that doesn't exist. And I really think there's a reason. Because they want to deny certain people in our state the right to vote or make it more difficult. And you know this better than anyone. If a grandparent finds it hard to go out and vote, the elder in the community, they may not get the chance to do it. If now they have to have a photo ID, and imagine this. In Quithluck, if someone said, oh, by the way, you need to go get a state ID with a photo. Well, that's done in Fairbanks or Anchorage. It's never going to happen. So what do you think is going to happen? That person may not vote anymore. They want to. But they may not be able to. So I hope as an organization, as individuals, these legislators, a few of them over there who have this idea, you put some pressure on them because this is a mistake. And I reminded them, reminded them of the history. You know, we just celebrated Elizabeth Paradovich Day. You know, that was about civil rights. We were ahead of the curve in this country, Alaska was. We were ahead of the rest of the country in making sure equal rights. Now. They're almost going backwards. That is a mistake. So I hope, as individuals and organizations, you do whatever you can. So again, I believe the Justice Department should oversee so we make sure people have equal rights. The state legislature not come up with some phony idea because they want to deny people's rights. The other thing, um, I just met with the potential incoming Secretary of Department of Interior had a long conversation with her about subsistence rights. As you know, I'm a strong, not, not just strong with a small s, but a strong with all capitals supporter of subsistence rights. And I spent some time with her, Sally Jewell. Uh, I'm hopeful, she seems reasonable, but what I did find out, she has made many trips to Alaska. So when I asked her, would you come to Alaska, there wasn't even a hesitation. She said, well, how many times? Which I thought, okay. I'm already liking this person because uh, she wants to be here and understand. As we know, Secretary Salazar came here every year. And I told her that's her minimum. She said, that's too low. And I said, that's good. That's the right attitude. Um, but we want to make sure uh, that she understands what we deal with here when it comes to subsistence rights. We also, as you know, have made a request for about three years now for the Indian Affairs Committee to have a hearing on subsistence rights. What's happening? They've done a report after 20 years. Now we want to know and get feedback from people. We haven't been uh, fortunate to get that hearing. Now I'm on the committee. So now we'll see how it goes. But we're going to have a hearing sooner or later because this is important for us to have this discussion. It, will it be controversial? Yes. But is it the right thing to do? Absolutely. So you will see me push hard on that. Let me, uh, 
Let me end by just saying, um, your delegation, the three of us, you know, Lisa, Don, and I, uh, we're working every day back there on Alaska issues. We are, uh, there is no day that we're not jointly connected to the hip uh, when we're working on the issues of Alaska. We fight every day for what's right. We put aside our Democrat and Republican labels and say what's right for our state, what's right for our people. Sometimes we have a little debate, but at the end of the day when it comes for Alaska, we're there 100%. And I'm going to tell you there's no better place to have a team back there working right now because it's somewhat dysfunctional. And having a team that's actually unified on Alaska issues is a powerful tool uh, because we're able to move and convince some of our people, our colleagues. I just brought up Secretary, or Senator Heitkamp from North Dakota, a new senator. We had her meet with a group of Alaska Native leaders in Anchorage. She is familiar with reservations. She had no idea, no idea, about Alaska Native corporations, village and uh, regionals and tribes and the local governments, how that all works here. She was so impressed by the knowledge that she had gained, so impressed that we went to the Native Heritage Center and at one point I'm looking for her, I'm like, Where, where'd she go? The staff's kind of, I don't know, where'd she go? So I find out she's in the gift store, which we like that actually, um, spend some money, but um, she was buying books on Alaska. I'm thinking, oh, she's just buying those to make me feel, you know, like she loves Alaska. So the next morning, we're at Brevkis and she starts quizzing people about Alaska, because she had read the books that night. Her husband said, oh yeah, she stayed up reading everything about Alaska, and she was testing me. And I thought, we're getting her on the right track here. So our job is not only to fight for these issues, but we got to bring people up here so they understand Alaska, not just in the urban areas, but in the, in the hubs and the villages of the state. They have to feel it, and they have to feel it not from the people only, but also, as I like to say, I don't want to give them a day like we have today. This is a beautiful day. I want the rain, I want the low clouds, plane delay, you know, all that that helps make them understand what we go through. I can, you know, the discussion uh, we've had on, with a couple of folks who have come up here, they've been on a couple of trips, some of the managers of some of these departments, and some have experienced some rough waters on some of their trips. And I said, well, how, how do you feel about Alaska? He said, we understand more than you can imagine. <laughs> and, I said, and then they usually say, and I hate to say this, now that you're done with dinner I can, or lunch, I said, and they said they've left a little bit behind. And I said, I bet you have. So first, thank you very much. Thank you for the honor you bestowed on me again today. Thank you for allowing two young women to come up and put that jacket on me because they were touching me all over. Uh, <laughs> And they said, we're just putting it on you. And I said, okay. <laughs> I have to explain that to my wife, but don't worry. Um, but it was a great honor to be presented with that today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. I'm not going to ask that question about earmarks when it's coming back, but oh, <laughs> okay. but uh, before we begin uh, our questions and answers, may I please have uh, Peter Narrows? Peter, you were going to do something? Uh, yeah. yeah. Is there a Can we get a microphone for Peter? Thank you, Senator. I rise as Grand Secretary of the Blessed Native Brotherhood. There's a lot of unfinished business. I haven't paid my dues. Is that what you're going to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Lamos is down in Ketchikan, so you might have to uh, <laughs> be careful next time you go in. But uh, really, we're very proud of you to have, to have you as our junior senator, and we appreciate the work you're doing. You took away any question I had in terms of your presentation, so thank you for that. Um, but I do rise uh, specifically to say thank you for trying to get these subsistence hearings going. That's important to me. Uh, I'd like to ask Eric Morrison, who was the first grand uh, vice president at last year's convention to uh, do the other part of the unfinished business, and which is to provide Suzanne with a copy of our resolutions. Okay. So. Thank you, Costine. Um, we have 35 resolutions that were adopted here at the uh, last grand camp in Sitka, as you're well aware. And many of these resolutions well, simply support what you're already doing. Um, we have a resolution on the census, which uh, 
a number of communities have uh, issues with identification of household, what a household is, uh, tribal rec recognition. We want, obviously, the state of Alaska to have better relations with the tribes and to establish a tribal liaison office. And we have a number of resolutions on the Forest Service um, having, of course, to do with subsistence and the landless. Um, others, of course, improving emergency services in the, in the smaller communities and, and other subsistence issues such as sea otters and, and then um, some uh, international issues, uh, uh, transboundary issues with the mining issues that are now developing in British Columbia. So I'll give that to your staff and I'm, I'm welcoming you on board and looking forward to your response. I have my card in here so if your staff has any questions on any of these, please feel free to contact us at any time. Fantastic. Can I add a quick, uh, one thing I didn't mention in my comments and that is, um, and you reminded me as you mentioned tribes, and that is we are working on a piece of legislation. We've introduced it already. This is on revenue sharing, revenue sharing for the Arctic oil and gas development. And the way we've designed that bill, uh, we know there's going to be a national bill at some point, but we wanted to put what we call the Alaska marker down. Why is that important? Because the way we've said in the past these revenue sharing bills for Alaska, the Gulf of, Alaska, or Gulf of Mexico gets this already, but Alaska does not. And for us, it could be worth upwards to $38 billion, huge amount. But usually what they do is they give that only to the states. The way we've designed it, we put our marker down to make it very clear, here's how it's going to work. A small amount to the state, regional corporations, village corporations, local communities, and tribes. All the way down, receive and using the 7i method so everybody shares in the wealth. Because offshore oil and gas development does not just touch the offshore area up there. Down in Ketchikan, I guarantee you, the ports will be busy with repairing ships that are going to the Gulf. Other ships will be stationed around the state. So as, we, as you move forward on other issues, I hope you take a look at that bill because what we're trying to do is put a marker down because I think tribes get left out all the time. They're always kind of like, oh, we can't do that. And my view is regionals, village, local governments and tribes, the four must be, and they receive the bulk of the money, not the state. I have no disrespect to state folks, but my view is the local communities will spend this better and know what they need. So, and our, and our clause in there to redistribute some of those monies by the 7i process is critical. Yeah. That, that's absolutely wonderful. It kind of goes back to what Emil was trying to do with our land claims. He wanted us to be able to share in, in those offshore oil development revenues in perpetuity. So let's, we, uh, we really applaud that effort. That's a big oh, earmark. <laughs> great, great, great earmark. Uh, so now I'd like to open it up for questions. And if I could ask you to, if you would keep your questions brief uh, so that we could get to as many people as possible. And I recognize Jody Mitchell. Jody. Comes the mic. We're going to give her a good exercise today. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome to Southeast Senator Baggage. Thank you. Um, I've met you before. Maybe you remember I work for IPEC. Yep. And I also serve on the Sea Alaska Board of Directors. Yep. But one thing that is really um, lacking, I see in the administration right now, is that there really isn't a good place to go for energy funding. Um, we've been, you know, the state has stepped up very well, thank goodness, yep. but, uh, you know, the, the START program is great, I'm happy with that program, at first I think it got a little bit of a rough start, but, but they really don't have any money to help with projects, and that to me is a little frustrating because they give people ideas of things to do, and then they don't have any funds to back it up. Right. And so then it becomes kind of my problem of trying to find a way to get that project online or to at least investigate it. Um, so anyway, I'm hoping that you have, you know, something that you can offer as a way to help us. Um, and then we, you know, we do have a geothermal project that I'm hoping there are federal funds for, uh, because I know that, you know, hydro is not considered renewable. Not by yet. Federal government. <laughs> yeah, I know you're working on that too, and I really appreciate that. Um, and then I do have a, a land mitigation problem um, in Huna. We have all the funding to do the, the, uh, the Gartina Falls project for Huna, mm -hmm. which will displace 30% of the diesel that we're using now uh, for a generation with the current loads. 
Um, but the Corps of Engineers is requiring us to find a like piece of land and dedicate it. Um, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, wetlands mitigation. Yeah, yeah it's wetlands. a ratio. And, you know, IPEC doesn't have any money. We're a nonprofit. And right. So I, I'm just at a loss. Sure. I just can't believe they can require that. Yeah, let us, on that issue, definitely let's make sure, I can tell you my staff has taken notes on these, so let's make sure we follow up, connect up with Suzanne here if you could. But the other thing I will say, on the energy, there's a disconnect. We have the energy department with the loan program, which they don't manage very well. I think that should go to Treasury. We have some ideas on that. Um, we know the Interior Department has a little bit of funding. USDA or NAG has a little bit of funding, but they're all disjointed. And so on these projects, let us, you know, we'll help work with you on that. Claire in my office in Anchorage is the master of when it comes to grants and finding things even before they're out. I would really encourage you to connect with her because we can help you kind of weave through this. I was just at the Alaska Brewing Company and uh, they got a, energy, a, a project done through USDA on uh, energy uh, conservation out there. Fantastic project, saving them an incredible amount of money, recycling some of their uh, um, waste end and turn it into energy. So let us let us work with you on that. But um, it's a struggle because they're all over the place, and we we need to. The budget situation we're in now may force us finally to consolidate these so they're more streamlined. So when you want a renewable energy project or an alternative energy project, there's a place to go rather than trying to figure out what place to go. So, but right now, definitely let's get you connected with Claire. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, is that Lee doing exercise back there, or did you have a question? <laughs> Lee, Lee Florendo. Uh -huh. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Florendo, and I've been the AD Child Welfare Coordinator with the Clinton and Heidi Troyes for a while. I've posed this question in this forum several times, and they keep saying that's a congressional issue. Lincoln and Heine has received $29,446 for a small tribe for Piqua, mm -hmm. $45,000 for a larger tribe. We had to send justifications for a year, almost two years, to include Juno, uh, for which we received $56,000. Our caseload last year was 640 plus children. We've been receiving this same amount since 1993 with no increases, and the amounts that we received were based on the 1990 census. We have more kids now, and we have more kids going into state custody, and we need more bodies. It's a congressional issue if you'd like to discuss if I can discuss it with you sometime in the future, I would like to because Let me, one Native official recently said that the amount that we received was never designed to meet the need. Question I have is where do we get what we need right. in Alaska? Let me try to answer it in a broad sweep and narrow. First off, um, for those that may not know this, Sally Smith, who actually has our office in the Sea Alaska building, uh, if you wouldn't mind getting some information to her, sooner than later on kind of those funding levels. But here's the challenge. Uh, the federal government is facing a huge debt and deficit, uh, which, I mean, good news is we've cut the annual deficit in half in the last four years, but we still got a sizable amount, $16 trillion of debt. So we got to keep working it down. It's going to be hard to get new money, but let me just say this. I'm looking at my role in appropriations a little different than most people. First off, as Rosita and I were kind of whispering back here, we don't have earmarks yet. I think maybe in, in a few years they're coming back mostly community-driven style. We'll put that aside for now. So the role of an appropriator, in my view now, is prioritization. In other words, what is the priority? Because what we usually will do is say, okay, we have less money, so let's just cut everyone. Well, the problem with that is we're not making decisions then. We're just kind of getting the easy way out. So programs like yours never get any help that they need. So here's some examples. Right now, Head Start is going to get cut under these automatic budget cuts. So will the program called Close Up. Now, I like Close Up. A lot of kids come to Alaska or to DC. It's a fantastic program. But if I have a choice between the two, in my mind, it is not complicated. Head Start. This has better impact long term. I love Close Up, but the problem is we don't get those choices anymore. We have to make a choice. 
Or for example, that subcommittee that are now chairing this additional one, there's an office which I had no idea existed. They came to me and said, oh, did you know this office? It's called the Office of the Private Sector. I said, well, what do they do? No one knows. And I said, well, why are we funding it? He said, well, because they've never had oversight. I said, well, they're now going to have oversight. I guarantee you that. But I, again, why do we fund that? Instead, what we do is we trim a little money off and say, well, then we're done. And then you end up trying to you know, work your magic, because that's what it is, trying to use that very little money to, dry, to deal with kids on an ever-growing population. Makes no sense. So I'm hopeful that there's still going to be some rough spots here on the budget for a little bit. But the long term is issues around our young people, education, health care for our young people. These are priorities. We shouldn't keep trimming them out and then say, oh, geez, there's not enough money now. Now we can't do the program when we have other things that we should be doing. Or this famous thing, not to get into detail, they call it the continuing resolution where we just keep pushing the budget forward. The problem with that, when we pass the continuing resolution, you know what we're going to fund? We're going to fund $400 million to NASA for the shuttle program that does not exist anymore. It's gone. It's in the museum. But because we're doing these congressional, uh, these uh, continuing resolutions, we don't get an opportunity to tweak that. That's insane. Can you imagine if I turned to you and said, I got 400 million, would you like maybe, I don't know, 50,000 more, 100,000 more? You'd be like, oh my, you know, you've been, it's been delivered. I mean, that is insane. What, so that's why, this cabal we're in right now for the next three, four weeks is going to be tough. And I'm hoping this budget cabal, we hit a brick wall hard. And the reason I say that is because maybe some of these guys will get some reality knocked into them. we got to do the right kind of budgeting. So programs like yours, the education programs, the early you know, programs like Head Start are not shortchanged every time you turn around because we can't get our budget act together. So we're going to be supportive. And I know this reauthorization, I want to say that's coming up on the, on the legislation. So. Let us work with you, get your details, only because that will help me make the case, and that's what I need. But I just want to give you a little budget 101, I apologize, but it's just, it's the most frustrating thing for me, because I'm thinking, no wonder the American people are mad at us. I mean, you know, we deserve it. It's embarrassing. And so, being on the Appropriations Committee, my role is going to be a little different than what I think most people are familiar with, because I'm going to look at the last three year budgets of every single agency, sub-department, I'm going to find out what they do and really put the squeeze on them because we can't do business as usual. we got to pick our priorities, fund them, and make sure they happen the right way. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Sally, if uh, Sally is standing there in the back in the green jacket, uh, she works for Senator Begich. Uh, she's uh, in the Sea Alaska office. In case you need to, uh, to uh, further talk to the senator or bring issues to him, go and see Sally uh, on the third floor in Sea Alaska. Uh, Bill Martin. Thank you, uh, Senator. The, uh, as you know, the position of area director for the BIA is open, and um, I know for a fact there are a couple of Alaska Natives that have put their name into the Department of Interior, but when we, we uh, last week we saw a query from the Department of Interior about two two names, but when we checked on them, it turned out they were internal to That's the right. department. But what, this, what Alaska needs is somebody from Alaska, especially Alaska Native, that understands um, the Native people struggle in this state and not have to worry about trying to train somebody from internal to the Department of the Interior. So if you can use your influence with, the, with that department and, and ask them to at least take a look at those Alaska Natives that have put their name in. You bet. Matter of fact, I talked to the incoming Secretary of Interior about this and I had a meeting scheduled, uh, I don't know what the right title is, but the Director of BIA or yeah, director of BIA, and it was canceled at the last minute. I don't know why, but I will tell you they know what we're looking for. And that is when you have an Alaskan position, it really means an Alaskan. And uh, we made that very clear to the secretary, uh, the potential incoming secretary, nominee. Uh, and I have a feeling we'll be in conversation with BIA pretty quick here. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll take a question from Jackie Kukesh, and then I see Bob Lozier right after that. Go ahead, Jackie. 
Thank you, Senator Vigage, for taking my question. I'm the Education Director for the Alaska Heritage Institute, and our question is in regard to the Alaska Native Edu uh, Equity Program Grants. Um, in October 2012, AFN passed Resolution 12-06, which, which would require the Alaska Native um, organizations to be the lead grantee or ANEP funding, and that schools, universities, and other nonprofits would be their partner. We at SHI would wonder if you, you know, would, um, if you would support amending the ANEP. As you know, um, the ANEP, what is uh, the Alaska Native uh, Equity Program Grants, means for Alaska Natives, is that over the last 12 years, um, um, I'm going to read this here, provides the means for Alaska Natives to participate directly in education. Over the past 12 years, school districts and universities have received over 83% of the ANUP funding with little results in the progress of Native students. <coughs> Alaska Native uh, graduation rates and Alaska Native dropout rates have remained stagnant. Um, while the number of Alaska Native College graduates has fallen. With that scenario, AFN passed the resolution in October yes. 2012 and um, would ask that um, Alaska Native organizations such as the Alaska Heritage and right. Health would be the lead grantees. We, we be, and I will tell you, I'm happy to look at this issue. I know my staff has had some discussion with AFN fairly recently in D.C. and here in Alaska. and. And, uh, sorry, did I do that? <laughs> I thought I said some words I wasn't supposed to. Um, but, uh, so absolutely we'll take a look at this. We, and we, they've been in our office and talking with Andrea, I don't know if you've had a chance, uh, as well as Agatha here, um, and getting kind of the, the information as well as some of the research you just talked about on the results. Because the programs we want to make sure, and you know this better than anyone, we want to make sure they have results. If it's just tallying up, we did the grant, we had four kids go through and they went off to whatever, but we don't know the results, then that's really not determining if that was a good program or not. And part of the role that federal government, I believe that Congress has not done a good job on, to be very frank with you, is oversight on these programs. What we do is we write laws, we pass money, and then we move on to some other thing and then we create our own crises that we get engaged in. Instead of saying, Okay, we've done this program for so many years, like I just mentioned about subsistence. 20 years under federal management, actually a little bit longer now. Report has been done. Now let's have the conversation. And everyone's like, well, is there a problem? Well, there's little problems. There could be big problems if we're not careful. Same thing here. Results have come in. Now it's our job to say, are those results what we need? And I can tell you just based on your numbers and what I've heard, we have some problems here. And we need to readdress how we manage this. So I, I hear exactly. I think. You know, Andrea, I know, is kind of the lead at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I'll, I'll make sure we get back with her and see where the status is. Be happy to. Thank you. And now we recognize our senior uh, statesperson, Bob Lozier, for a short question. <laughs> <laughs> I even know Bob. Uh, so did you hear that? She did a lot of editorializing in that. <laughs> Thank you, Rosita. Senator Vegich. Uh, I'll pose my question first and then try to limit my comment after that. I would mean, really request from your office uh, a copy of the legislative intent language or any statements that you or the delegation have made with regard to the Violence Against Women Act. As you know, the way the bill came out, it, it treated Alaska differently, Alaska Native tribes differently than the rest of the American Indian tribes across America with a special provision and a, a savings language. The best we can discern, it says that uh, the law that was in effect several years ago is still in effect. There's nothing more or less. Uh, but then it creates a, a situation where we are treated differently than all the Alaska tribes in America, in that our women and children are being discriminated against you don't have equal protection, uh, and our courts, our tribal courts, are inhibited from assisting them uh, because uh, 
one, our court orders are not uh, going to be recognized uh, very well. And secondly, uh, it, it says that basically, uh, uh, if a woman is married to a non-native person, uh, that case cannot be brought into our court. And so, you know, my question is, could you provide us the, the legislative intent and the information so that we can uh, deliberate this in our upcoming tribal assembly meeting coming in April? And the last thing is, being treated differently, Alaska Natives, because of Indian country arguments and whether or not we exist as tribal members or tribes in Alaska, that conversation, that discussion, that policy needs to be addressed you know, by our, our congressional delegation and with the governor and the attorney general. You know, we are in conflict over our children and families uh, in, in Alaska State Court, and this legislation under VAWA uh, basically works to, do, to diminish our sovereignty and our inherent rights. And we got to change this business of policy uh, and how we're treated as Alaska Natives. Thank you very much, Bob. You are absolutely right. And let me tell you, I will be happy to present to you my floor speech on VAWA on uh, comments I've made. Uh, this is why I've introduced the Safe Families and Village Act, because it is a huge gap. We had a challenge on VAWA, uh, and that is, and I said it on the floor, I said it's an important piece of legislation from a broad sense, but Alaska Native communities were not equalized. The law that existed before was the same as today, which of course means uh, limited jurisdictions for Alaska Native communities. I disagree with that. And that's why the Alaska uh, our, our, uh, Safe Families and Village Act rectifies that, moves in the right direction, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so we're happy to do that. Uh, now I will be honest with you. In all due respect to the folks here from the state, we are in a little conflict with the state. They don't like our bill because it gives more rights in their mind to tribes to adjudicate cases. Well, we're okay with that because I'll tell you right now, with 60 plus percent of Alaskans going back in the jail after every time they get out, the system is broken and it needs to be fixed and we need to look toward new innovative approaches and try and true, I'll tell you, for generations, tribal courts have worked. Generations, elders and youth courts have worked for generations. So we should, and it's not about, and I know I get in debate with the state folks on this, it's about sovereignty. No, it's about making sure that people get adjudicated with local input from the tribes that really understand how to help manage the situation and get less people serving in jail that are Alaska Native community members. So um, I'm happy to surprise, because I, this, my staff would, they're not saying this right now, but I can feel them right now saying you need to now stop before you go over the edge here. But uh, this is so basic to me, so basic. We had to get VAWA done. It's an important bill. Don't get me wrong. That is very important, especially for reservations. Because if you know, the House tried to strip even that out. So reservations, you know, American Indians living on reservations would lose their rights. We thought, well, are you kidding me? And then they tried that and they lost. And they passed the Senate version that passed. But we're going to be back at this, Bob. And I, I hope as you have that uh, discussion, that you look at the bill that we brought, that AFN has supported, uh, that you look at it as your own organization and determine how you could be a partner and help us move this forward as a unified delegation, which we're not, to be frank with you, on this one yet, and the state. To me, this is just so basic. We can have the debates on sovereignty all we want, but that's not what I'm debating here. What I'm debating is we need to fix this system. If it means we give tribes more rights, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because if it means that we save a generation from ending up in jails or beating a woman or committing child abuse or getting hooked on drugs, I'm for making a difference. So mm -hmm. I, I, I get very passionate about this because I will tell you in caucus I had great debate over this. And I, uh, Heidi Heidkamp, when she came to the center from North Dakota, we brought this up with the Native community leaders we met with in Anchorage and she turned to me and said, Whatever you need, I'm going to help you because I had no idea, no idea the difference here. 
So part of it's educating our colleagues, but having a vehicle to do it, and we do have one. So we'll get you the material of my floor statement on this and my continual statements that I'm making like this in public.